So I'm going to go. Yeah. So, uh, cracking on with this evening. Part of this introduction, you all know potatoes, I'm sure, and there are people who get allergic to that family of, of, of potatoes and tomatoes and aubergines. And the macrobiotic people, that's why they say, don't eat too much of that particular one family, which we do depend on a lot. So, you've all had a lifetime's experience of eating chips, and now you've had a bit of ochre. And that's partly to illustrate um, what I'm trying to suggest this evening, which is we need to change our perspective a bit uh, in order to appreciate the fertility that's around, especially in the city, but also uh, it's a question of, rather than thinking, ooh, that's smelly, that's dirty, I don't want to have anything to do with it, to get involved in all these matters which, uh, yeah, we associate with dirt and muck and smell. And if you look at the brief guide to the religions of the world, <coughs> I always do say, just in case, I hope I haven't mortally offended anybody who's deeply religious, but... Uh, it kind of gives us a continuity in terms of yeah, thinking about the shared characteristics between all, all religions. I've put organic people at the bottom, so maybe organics is part of some other kind of religion, and it has its churches. Anyway, um, but yeah, each one gives you a little jokey definition of each of those beliefs. And we can also take the pee out of ourselves by yeah, suggesting that we might be part of that as well. And, yeah, part of that is a process of uh, what I call desensitisation. So it's exposing you to the word S-H-I-T rather a lot. Uh, and you can all interpret it. Most of you have got the joke kind of bit. But, yeah, this process of uh, familiarising ourselves with that material and not being worried about it anymore and seeing it rather than as a dirty negative uh, yeah, source of disease that actually all the processes that we're talking about this evening are ways of improving the soil and making the soil more benevolent and, and actually health-giving and seeing these materials not, not as a source of dirty nastiness but actually as a, a real source of health. So that's the change I'm hoping to achieve. And, yeah, tagging on to the bottom of that, uh, have you all heard of the caste system in India? And they've got their untouchables cast. Yeah? So historically, it just happened that certain people got right into shit and dedicated their whole lives to it and made a living out of it in some way. But then the rest of society said, right, they're the ones that are going to do that and we'll leave them to it. And we won't. Well, it's rather what we've got in, in this country, like the poor bin men who have to run round after the bin lorries. And there's, there's only about half a dozen, a dozen bin lorries in the whole of Sheffield, poor go so they've got to run round everywhere doing it. But, uh, yeah, this is my experience of recycling, uh, starting off 20, 25 years ago. And again, it's starting to look at the world in a very different way. So we're trying to assess, partly, uh, if we are bringing in materials to our growing system, feeding them to the soil, one of the questions is, can that material be digested and incorporated into the soil without disrupting the soil or the plants that are going to grow in it? And again, a big tip would be, with all the materials, the bulky organic matter materials that I've mentioned, leaf mould, compost and manure, if you wait until they're fully mature, and one way of testing that is by chopping through the material with not so sharp spade, a blunt spade. If they'll chop through readily, easily, um, like butter, then that material is probably ready to go into the ground. And by waiting until it's fully mature, when you add it to the ground, it's not going to disrupt your soil. It won't be a burden on the microbes to digest that material. In fact, if you store it for long enough, wait till only, only use mature bulky organic matter, then you can add it just before your crop, and it won't cause a disruption, so you can get away with more. And the point being that the longer that those materials stand in a heap and are digesting uh, and uh, maturing in a heap, they, they mature quicker than if you add them to the soil when they're immature, uh, because potentially they might never actually break down if they're added when they're immature. And we'll go more into that. That's partly about waiting for compost to be fully ready. Could I just say that my experience with um, horse muck? Yeah. Uh, 
Um, sometimes there seem to be lumps in it that are really sticky. And yeah. Maybe that is that wouldn't be if it's irregular in form, like if you've got one bit that's not the same as the rest, that's another indicator that it's not uniform and it hasn't been turned enough. Therefore, it hasn't all been digested and therefore it isn't ready to go into the ground yet. Why is the horse the big sticky? That would be dollop salt. Yeah, break apart. But ideally, you should have that well mixed in with straw, preferably, and you shouldn't. It's not enough straw in it. If, if you have a horse on wood shavings, yeah. you shouldn't really use that for like three years because wood shavings don't break down. So like ashes, straw manure. Yeah. Ash has mentioned a good point. You do get wood chip in these materials nowadays. And what wood, the wood chip is, is it's a form of carbon. And that's, uh, again, a, a disruption. It takes a lot of extra nitrogen in the soil or in the compost to break down that woody carbon material. So that's a, a big point about composting, we'll come back to that in a bit. But the carbon and nitrogen balance. Uh, and critically, the point there is, if you can get hold of that uh, horse manure when it's fresh, fresh from the stable, and you stack it up once, and you turn it twice, then you're not going to have irregular lumps where it's not broken down. And that's about, rather than asking for mature material from your supplier, if you ask for fresh stuff, and you're prepared to actually work on it, uh, you will end up with a much better product rather than assuming that somebody's done the work for you and it might not have been turned enough in the yard. And one more point on that, by doing that, having fresh material that's hot, well, then you can add concentrates to the bulky organic matter, to the compost. And in the composting process, the nutrients that are in the fer fer on con concentrated fertilisers will get a chance to bond on to the bulky organic matter, the manure, and they'll actually be more stable and more long-lasting and wait until the plants need them in the soil. So that would be best practice to get hold of the manure fresh stage. Enough of it, uh, which is a cubic metre or more, so it'll heat up and actually add some fertilisers in at that point. And that also gives you the option of you could make a fertiliser specific to fruit with long-term fertilisers in it, which would be things like hoof and horn, volcanic rock dust. I'll come back to that in a bit. So it's very much the more the process that you've got control of, the better result you're going to get. Okay, sure. And, yeah, sad Robbie's not here. I was going to give him a copy of this. So, yeah, uh, this is relevant mostly to Sheffield, but a little bit further afield. Take a copy of this. And, yeah, if Robbie was here, I was going to say, he's, uh, he's trying to supply this farm shop at Worlow Farm. He's got a lovely shop, but no supply of food because they're not growing much at Willow. And this is a list uh, my friend did of all the farmers who will, who will supply you with manure. In some cases you've got to go and get it. In some cases you can pay a bit more and they'll bring you a trailer load. Depends how far they've got to cart it. But again, if you go and actually look around the farm and assess the animals and see are they happy beasts, do they smell nice, that kind of thing and actually check out your farm, then you know what kind of manure you're going to get. Whereas if you just phone them up blind and you've never seen them before and you don't know their, their yard and the conditions, you might get some really naff stuff. In the worst case, Ali... Oh, here it is, just in time. In the worst case, Ali, we've had situations... We took on sites where manure had been left in a heap and hadn't been covered for about ten years. And it turns into coal. It just carbonises. So it's washed and baked and washed and baked. And what you end up with is a solid lump, like a mineral, yeah. like coal. Like like Possibly it had been left for ever such a long time and actually ended up like that. Can we sit Robbie down here? Yeah, sure. And yeah, this sheet you've got here, Robbie, to start you off. Yeah. It's uh, a list which is really, we phoned up lots of the farms round about and asked about their manure supply. Right. But some of them mentioned we've got chickens, you know, we can, you can have some eggs. Some of them are actually market gardeners and got produce. Right. And the suggestion here is, this one little sheet here really should be the key to local food in Sheffield. Right. Because these are the guys who have got all the land, and they've had the tradition, and some of them have still managed to keep their animals, only just. Uh, but yeah, any, anybody who's interested in uh, sourcing local produce from around Sheffield, mm -hmm. these are the guys to get in touch with. And some of them will have been through 30 years of hell 
and been on the point of suicide for the last couple of, couple of decades because there's no money in it and they're facing kind of the end of the line. But things are turning around and more contact between us city folk and then rural country farming folk, that is going to be a positive thing. So some, some of them might be grumpy old buggers who don't want to talk to anyone. Fair enough. So I'll go to the next one. But yeah, if you back to the main point, if you're trying to source your main source of bulky organic matter, then this is where manure ca comes from. And like I say, some of them might process it and have already have lots of gardeners that they're supplying. Some of them might not be so much. But uh, another main message, if you could get some cattle manure and some horse manure, and then there might be a pig farmer, and then there's that alpacas guy, if you could get a bit of each of their different manures, you'd be better off than just taking one supply. And that's partly about thinking in the long term again. If you were growing for five years and you had the same cattle manure from the same person every time, well, that's, yeah, that's probably got certain nutrients in, it, nutrients in it, like nitrogen, but it's maybe lacking in other nutrients. So again, by sourcing a diversity of materials, without really thinking about it, you're much more likely to end up with a balanced nutrient profile in your soil. So that's the general recommendation. Well, Healy Farm have taken over, uh, they've got their stock of animals, and then they've taken over the vegetable waste round, which I started in the 80s and carried on for about 15 years. And, yeah, mixing in, again, diverse materials, so taking mixed animal manure, they've got several different types of animal, and then adding to it the retail shop waste and mixing that, chopping it up and mixing it together, gives you a really nice balanced product. And the worms really love breaking down food, basically. So food waste, once it's chopped up, and they like it actually soupy and almost liquidised. Uh, I've got some worms to show you in a minute, maybe. So yeah, that little sheet uh, could have great importance, but not everyone is going to be up to the stage where they can handle or accommodate a load of manure. So it might be a question of going to the farm and just having a few bags full at a time. And also having to compromise, if you're in small conditions, if you haven't got much space, then you'd rather get the mature stuff despite what I've said, because uh, you haven't got enough space to get a whole cubic metre and actually cook it up. How discerning should you be? What if those animals were fed on GM foods and yeah. so a pump full of antibiotics? GM, GM's definitely stuff. around in animal feed terms, yeah. although we're lucky enough not to have it in our mainstream food supply. Yeah. And, yeah, you'd ask and see what they say. Uh, most of these farmers are going to be impoverished relative to yeah. big farms. Mm. And so the, the truth of it is, over the last 10, 20 years, they haven't been able to afford uh, all the agrochemicals that big guys use. Mm. And by economic necessity, they've ended up being virtually organic. Mm. Having said that, one or two of them, you'd get vets treating certain illnesses, worming them, that kind of thing, mm. in stables. And, yeah, again, that process of if you can heat up the material under your own control and it gets up to... Ooh, Okay, 40, 50 degrees mm. centigrade, and that is enough to neutralise and uh, uh, evaporate, quite literally, mm. some of those contaminants that might be in the manures. Mm. And like I say, by adding other materials in, by dil diluting, mm. but crucially this heating process, uh, by the end of that process, you will have upgraded the material. So the answer to Robbie's question is, you might take in material that's slightly suspect or has mm. had... I've had a load of manure I think they put Jay's fluid into. So they cleaned out the yard and swept it out with Jay's fluid and some of it had got into the manure and it made it colder. It didn't heat up as much. So I didn't get that, that supplier again. So it's worth, again, visiting the farm, having a look round. So, so what about nitrogen then? Nitrogen. Because most farmers, since, mm, what, 80% now are on silage more than here. Yeah. And to get maximum production of silage yeah. they plaster with nitrogen so they add extra nitrogen when they're making the silage yes right well uh, if you think about it in our diets yeah a lot of people when they try a bit of cabbage they think they expect it to taste smelly because of the extra nitrogen that's been put into the uh, growing and also we've got the excess nitrogen that's washing down into the water courses where it actually takes all the oxygen out of the water and kills fish so Generally, that has, has been a problem, and maybe nitrogen is the one we don't really need to worry about. I, I can mention green manures as well. 
and in organic farming, they've used a lot of nitrogen fixers, which are the peas and beans and uh, trefoils, alfalfa. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's just replacing one nutrient. So we've got to remember that nitrogen is critical, but it's just one of the many uh, elements that are crucial to plants. And here's an idea from biodynamics. Where do plants get the nitrogen from without all that extra supply? Air. Air. Right? And that's a kind of, again, one of these points where you wouldn't think about it initially, but, yeah, plants really do get maybe the majority of their nitrogen from the, from the air, from the atmosphere. And they breathe it in through their leaves. And that would be a very different perspective from that old uh, kind of farming, stick a load of nitrogen on, and you'll, you know, make it go whoosh. But uh, gradually growing and, yeah, sourcing the, the elements that are around instead of having to bring in extra. So that's part of the, part of the answer. Uh, <coughs> we'll give, I'll, I'll give some more answers in a bit as well. So that's just thinking about that. And, yeah, a couple of books. Uh, this book, Composting for All by Nicky Scott. He's a lovely man. And this is really good introduction to small scale. So it's partly about worm composting, which really is keeping worms as pets uh, and looking after them and tending them, not quite on a daily basis, but making sure they're looked after. Uh, and that, he was part of the Community Compost Network. And Community Compost Network, look, it's like on Have I Got News For You when they have the specialist <laughs> periodical. This is a magazine, I think it's quarterly, it was all about compost. And that was just about small-scale local community composting. There was another one for the industry, which was a great, big, flashy, sell you loads of products type uh, magazine. But yeah, if you're interested uh, in going into home composting or looking at the community compost network, I'll leave those over there. And one little book. There are more books, but this one uh, by a guy called Alvin Seafart. And he was a biodynamic practitioner. So that's worth it if you're thinking about uh, the biodynamic side of, of composting. And, yeah, just, I'll mention again later, but thinking of that as homeopathy for plants, soils, and compost. So I've got these little samples here uh, that you add to compost, or you can add them to the soil. I'll show you these now. That one is the manure that's been stuffed inside uh, the horn of a cow, and buried over winter, and they say that that has then made it more potent and vibrant in certain ways. And when you add just a tiny fraction to it of it to a compost, it'll inoculate it with certain microbes and certain properties, and that will steer it off in a certain direction. Another one I've got here is this is preparation 501, which is just ground up quartz. So that's nothing special. It's been ground into a fine powder. And again, adding that into compost or alternatively into soil, that's supposed to be like homeopathy. It's a, a millionth or a billionth, you know, ba barely perceptible amount that you add in. But this would trigger certain reactions in terms of microbes in a compost heap and steer it in a better direction so that you end up with a better product. So that's homeopathy for uh, compost. Those who use homeopathy already will accept that idea. Of course all animals haven't got a conscious mind to get in the way of homeopathy, so it works for animals. It doesn't work when humans have got their brains in the way, but homeopathy can work if you don't think about it too much. <laughs> so, that's Miss Data. And next one, page before that, these graphs, investment and return cycle. Yeah. I've been thinking about economics rather a lot this week. I'm thinking about the economics of projects as well. <laughs> but, um, this is a rather obvious uh, suggestion, and this does relate to any investment. So you could take it from economics and graft your understanding of economics and finance onto your growing activities. And simply, the more you put in, the earlier, the better, because you're going to get more out quicker. And the quicker you put it in, rather than waiting and slowly putting fertility in over a long, long period, uh, the more you can pump up the soil and get this 5 to 10% of organic matter in the soil, then you're off up to full cropping as soon as possible. And a lot of people, including myself, took maybe 5 to 10 years to realise quite how much we had to put into the soil. And you could summarise that maybe, uh, this is very rough kind of guesstimates, but with my allotments, which are one-eighth of an acre, 
I like to put at least a cubic metre of mature bulky organic matter, compost leaf mould, manure, per year. A tonne per year for an allotment. That equates to eight tonnes per acre for uh, if, if you're improving farmland. And with Robbie's sample from Worlow, the soil sample last, mm. last week, mm. we saw that it was very unimproved basic mm. clay mm. and hadn't had enough organic matter to turn it into really good topsoil that you could then do anything with. Uh, so that's the recommendation there. And to equate that into an easier measure, if you put a layer about 10 centimetres, 3 or 4 inches thick, over the soil that you're going to cultivate, that would jumpstart it, get it up to a, a, a kind of cropping uh, quality from the first year onwards. Right? So that's quite a lot of work, but that is the le learning from experience, and that applies to any soil. So even if you've got what's been used before and it's cropping already, you'd still want to put something like that in to improve it so that your job is easier, so, so that plants grow easier in the longer term. And it depends, then it depends on which soil you've got. If you've got the sandy soil that I've got on the top of the hill, virtually every year, I'm afraid. Uh, but if you've got a heavier clay soil, you should have more nutrients actually held in that soil or a silty soil in the valley. So then it depends on kind of how your soil's uh, managed in the longer term. But initially, and anybody who's starting in, on a new plot, think about it in that term. But yeah, that, that is just simply an econo economic recommendation. Treat this as part of the regular world where you've got to invest something before you're going to get something back and that is the scale at which you want to try to invest so that does require bringing in the large amounts of different materials and yeah uh, one more little point there is thinking about producing a backlog so yeah if you had a small garden let's say and you're getting a bag at a time of rotted manure from your local supplier preferably not in the garden centre, because it will cost ten times more from the garden centre. And, uh, yeah, you're adding a little bit in. But then you get to the stage, whether it's with manure, adding it into the soil, or, say, with leaf mould, if I'm making up potting compost and potting more plants on, making multi-purpose compost, you get to the point where you run out. And, again, it's a learning from experience. that So, rather than getting just enough for the job I'm doing that day, if I can get twice as much and store a load of it until I need it later and I've always got spare available for when I need it. So that's accumulating more than you need, creating a backlog, so that, yeah, when a load of extra plants turn up that you hadn't thought of, you've got extra manure and extra leaf mould that you could you know, accommodate them. But every situation is different, and each person's capacity to do that is going to change, but having more, more than enough available. Let's have a look at page 18, which is a breakdown of these three types of soil improving and fertility giving materials. <coughs> and that's first thinking about what we call humus. And this is the first chance when, if you want to open up the bag you've got on, in front of you and have a little feel, just with your, your fingers, that is one way of defining what humus is. So you get your fingers in, have a little feel. It should be lovely and soft. I'd call it velvety or silky. Velvety, silky. And this is mature leaf mould, which was actually collected the year before last, so it's now about 30 months old. Well, yeah, about 30. So it's two and a bit years old, two and a, nearly a half. And this stuff is now up to the best quality grade, where... If I've got rough leaves, I don't dig them into the soil, I leave them on the surface, if it's not made into leaf mould, for the same reason denitrification that Asher mentioned. If I've got uh, leaf mould that's maybe six months to a year old, it will have cooked up, it will have heated up, and it will have neutralised anything nasty, any pathogens in that material, and that will be ready to go into rough soil. So if I had a heavy clay soil and six-month-old leaf mould, then I can dig it into the soil. If I dig it in too early, it's got the leaves actually have uh, a, a, yeah, chemical suppressants in them which stop an, anything else growing. So if it's just leaves, you don't dig it into the soil, because that should actually stop things growing. It has to be cooked up to make leaf mould first. And then at various stages, depending on how long I keep it, it can, I can increase the range of uses. 
So by the time it's two and a half years old like this, if this is riddled uh, through a sieve, then I can get fine, fine particle size, and that can be added to sand, and maybe a bit of grit, or perlite and vermiculite, which I've got samples of up here, and then I can make my own potting compost, and then I don't have to rush off to the garden centre to get more dodgy, dubious, multi-purpose potting compost. So that's just uh, an explanation of this word humus, and in that sense, it's thinking about organic matter in the soil, which can bond onto clay, and then other nutrients can bond onto that. So it's like a sponge in the soil. And the other suggestion with leaf mould is it's great for rooting. So if you're planting fruit trees, depending on how much leaf mould you put in there, that will all get digested into the soil within the first couple of years. But again, it gives pathways for the roots of the fruit trees to get into rough soil, eating, up, eating the way through the leaf mould, which is easy to get through. And when we do cuttings, we put leaf mould into that mixture, and it's almost like the leaf mould turns into root system. Yeah. But especially for young plants, young seedlings, when you pop them on before transplanting out, it makes it a lot easier for them to get a big root system established before you plant them out. So that's just leaf mould as an example of humus. And I'll show you some pictures of collecting leaf mould and what's involved in that in a bit. Uh, but yeah, so the bulky organic matter, the first property is physical in the soil just to separate out the lumps of clay or soil and allow rooting to happen. Then it's got a biological aspect a bit later because the microbes will digest uh, manure, compost, leaf mould. Mm. And it also does have some, but only a small fraction, of actually bringing chemical elements into the soil. So that's the way to think of the bulky organic matter. First impact, physical. Leaf mould is one. And then this little chart about manures, back to your point about nitrogen. So some of these manures, once we get commonly, coarse, horse and cow, they have more nitrogen compared to the other main uh, elements in uh, phosphate and potassium. And yeah, if we're thinking about it in composting terms, if we add green material to our compost, that also has lots of nitrogen. And very often people have a lawn. If you collect up all your lawn mowings and leave them in a heap, they'll actually first heat up very quickly and very strong. And then, because they're, they're all nitrogen and there's no carbon, they'll actually end up being a mush and kind of break down to virtually nothing after a while. So that's green materials indicating lots of nitrogen. And, of course, cattle... Yeah, if we think of cows, they are composting machines because they not only regurgitate their food before they swallow it, but they've got seven stomachs. So they're digesting the grass seven times before it comes out the other end. But essentially it's still grass, and therefore it's still got a lot of nitrogen in it, possibly too much. And that thing about, yeah, I'm thinking about farting again. So if they feed too much nitrogen in one end of the, of the cow, that's why you get too much methane, oh yeah, too much methane released into the atmosphere, and that is one of the global warming things. So too much nitrogen in, and it has a, uh, a, a response out the other end. Uh, and then... On the, on the phosphorus side, if we're after really good flavour, enhancing the flavour of what we're growing, which we will want to do, especially when we're growing things like herbs, then it's things like chicken and goat manure. Mm -hmm. uh, and that produces a stronger flavour in the end product, because it's got more phosphorus in it. So do you have to be, do you have to be very careful with chicken manure? Uh, Mm. Very stuff, I've got a sample here. This stuff here, that's actually pigeon droppings, right. scraped up. And of course, when I collected it, I had to have a mask on, because you yeah. don't want the dust getting in your lungs, for one thing. And that's another, yeah, a lot of these sensible suggestions when we're turning compost and manure. If it's dried out, we don't want that to get spores on our lungs either. So yeah, that on its own would kill plants, because yeah. it's too strong. So that's got to be chopped up, mixed in with other materials uh, to actually dilute it and hopefully bond it onto those other materials before it gets in contact with plants. Uh, that's true of some of these concentrates. But a lot of these organic ones, it's hard to overdose with. Things like seaweed, calcified seaweed and the volcanic rock dust, you can put as much on as you like and plants won't actually suffer from it. Whereas with especially like the chemical liquid feeds, that's one of the classic answers when you have gardeners question time and the answer is you fed it too much you've overfed it 
The other one is overwatering, where people have you know, tried to look after their plant too much, and those, so too much fertility, too much watering, you can actually end up uh, killing your plants. So that would be present uh, either in bone meal, phosphorus, or if you're uh, animal averse, you don't want to exploit animals, we found this form of rock phosphate, and it's over here, it's this red stuff, and that is dinosaur bones. So it's his, you know, prehistoric phosphate bones. And that came from Tunisia because we have no uh, mineral source of phosphate in the whole of Europe, which is why uh, they collect it from the sewage works. It's the one thing that pays them to extract from the sewage waste and recycle phosphate. So the phosphorus cycle is actually crucial. And again, we, we can't use too much because there's only so much to go around. Uh, so that's the vegan alternative to uh, bone meal. And then on the potash side of things, we describe these manures as cold and wet. That's not when they come out of the animal, but uh, they won't heat up so much and they tend to be <coughs> moister in, in consistency. But they're great for especially growing roots. Uh, there was one allotment I took on, and I'd heard that back in the Second World War it was uh, used as a, a pig small holding, and we found great bones in the soil, pig bones. And because the soil hadn't been cultivated for 20 years, uh, it wasn't that fertile, but as soon as we turned the soil and disturbed all these bones, it released lots of potash, and we had enormous crops of potatoes about that big <laughs> coming from the soil. So that would be especially from either pigs or these animals called humans, and you're one of them. <coughs> and later on, yeah, I'll show you how to actually recycle your own wastes. And critical to that would be separating your solids and liquids, but I'll come back to that in a bit. Also, comfrey I've put down there, and again, that's, that's my cycle. I recycle my own sewage and feed comfrey plants, which then produce a liquid feed or go into the compost or get put on as mulch. And that sends it through two or three cycles before it comes back into the uh, eating uh, uh, zone. So rather than digging fresh sewage into the soil, don't do that. But feed it to something else, process it in some other way before it comes back into the uh, eating zone. And then just a couple more here. I've mentioned this liming a couple of times, but this is initially a chemical reaction. So when you put lime into the soil, it reacts with especially the clay in the soil and I mentioned last week, it breaks open the clay, so instead of having subsoil, it turns your subsoil into topsoil. And very much that's once you've added a bit of organic matter as well. But yeah, to consolidate hard physical labour when you've done some digging and weeding, if you put a bit of lime in and came back in a year, that soil would still be improved and be improving while the lime works, works its way in. Whereas if you just dig and weed and then leave a patch, it'll just pan down and go back to what it was before and won't actually end up being that much improved. And then last one on this list, this is the concentrated fertilisers which are adding nutrition and their principal action is biological. So they're feeding microbes in the soil, they're also bringing in these major elements like nitrogen, potassium and phosphate and lastly they will have some tiny physical effect but because they're concentrated they don't take up much space, much volume but they have more of a, a biological impact initially. And that's things like, yeah, I'll mention these and describe these later, seaweed for short-term release, uh, hoof, things like hoof and horn, which are very much slower to release their nutrients, and best of all, volcanic rock dust, which is like a soil-building process, adding a wide spectrum of nutrients to a soil. Volcanic rock dust, wonderful. So, you have some renews. lights, Paul. Sorry, you yep. have the spectrum of renewers. What percentage do you, do you need in your manure of phosphorus, nitrogen, potassium? What's well, there is roughly. That's reminded me about a little point. We've got this stuff called blood, fish, and bone, uh, and that's a mixture of blood, fish, and bones. But yeah, here's a cautionary note. One cautionary note: uh, when you see a bag of blood, fish, and bone made up by gem, especially but there's some suppliers. If it's got a balance between those three major nutrients, and it would usually be 666 percentage, 666 percent, uh, actually, if you take just organic uh, sources of the, those materials, they wouldn't be balanced like that. And the point is that although they put the word organic on the packet, 
organic blood, fish and bone, it says, organic-based often, what they've done is they've taken some organic materials and then chucked in a load of chemicals to pump up the potassium and phosphate, so it's the same as the nitrogen, but it's chemicals. So that's a caution if we're trying to be organic. Uh, watch out, because some products, they might be organic-based with a load of chemicals on top. Mm. And having bought some of that and used it, that makes the... Yeah, the, the general flavour you get from chemicals in that experience is burned plastic. Mm. And that's a, a tainting in the actual flavour of the produce. Mm. Mm. So it's not good. And yeah, uh, we have got suppliers of pure organic blood, fish and bone, but it's mm. harder to get hold of, mm. more expensive. Mm. And one more cautionary point while you've got me on, the, on it is back to the manure list. And yeah, what's happened in the last uh, five years is, especially where... Uh, especially some of the larger stables, they've got contractors to look after their fields for them and do their weeding. And these contractors will spray a, 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 a systemic uh, herbicide to kill the perennial weeds like docks and dandelions. And in the last five years, they've used this stuff called aminopyridol. And it's actually worth writing that down. Amino, like amino acid, and pyridol, P Y R. I-D-O-L, aminopyridol, and rather than just being a simple chemical, it is uh, something else. It's been, it genetically changes uh, the plant's structure. And the story is that they spray this on the field, and then the horses come around and eat the grass and consume some of the chemical. And then they shit it out, and it's stacked up in the yard for maybe six to twelve months, and it's cooked up like you'd, you'd hope. And then we get it off the stables, and especially with the Solanaceae, the potatoes and tomato family, it genetically distorts the way they grow. So instead of getting big leaves of tomatoes, you get hundreds of little leaves. And that is two to three years after it was applied on the field, mm. and after it's been through the horse. Mm. Uh, so that's a real killer. And it's this, just illustrating this dislocation, rather than using that manure on site, the stables or the farms, they're never going to use it. They're, they're not interested in how it ends up as a, a finished product. They just want a weed-free soil. And that can be a real problem uh, at, in terms of being a grower. So again, sourcing your materials, and that's a caution against, yeah, if they don't actually do the weeding themselves, uh, and just send some contractor around to do it, if they're really, the more wealthy the place you're getting them from, the more suspect you need to be. Yeah. The Royal Horticultural Society had a big campaign against it. That was three years ago. But uh, and they took it off the list of registered pesticides. Now they've got it back on. And it is also, that's probably sold under a whole load of different guises. But it illustrates the challenge and difficulties to, to remain organic. We think we're doing the right thing by getting manure. And then we find it's got a sting in the tail kind of thing. So I'm going to spend the rest of the first half, which will be another 20 minutes. So we'll be running 10 minutes late. Uh, just looking through some slides. And initially this first one is slightly out of focus. That might be a good idea. Second one's out of focus. Let's just go back one. So... I'll show you some of these in a minute. These are two compost worms, and these are Icenia fetida. They're red tiger worms. You can see the banding on them, so it's out of uh, focus. Uh, and those are the worms which digest food waste directly. And they're different from the worms that we find generally in the soil, which are Lumbricus terrestris. I'll show you that in a minute. But here's my mate's little box, two boxes that he's used and he's put all his food waste in there he's put a bit of straw in the bottom found and added some compost worms which you can just extract wherever fertility arises so from a compost or manure heap he's put some worms in there and with his bare hands he's raking through this rotting vegetable waste because he's used to it, he's brave <coughs> and he's got his lovely selection uh, these are all mature, uh, i.e. ready for breeding, compost worms. They take three months to get big enough to reproduce, 
and then they might, you might have 100 eggs per worm. So in six months, you'll get a lot more worms if you keep feeding them and looking after them. But they want, uh, yeah, in introduction of fresh food on the surface, which they'll then come to the surface, work their way through, drag down. And it really is the smelly and mushy and you know, gackier the better. Mm. So that was, here's another one. Uh, it's converted little box. And beneath the surface, again, a mass of worms in there. Uh, if you go in the army, they teach you how to eat worms. And apparently they're quite nice. They'd be like spaghetti. <laughs> but if you do want to do that, like with snails, you'd want to flush them out first by feeding them on lettuce or something. Something innocuous or not grit, so you don't get a, a, a mouthful of grit when you go through. So that is vermicomposting, making worm cast as the final product. Alongside, you get a wet leachate uh, uh, moisture, too much moisture soaks through, and we have a tap on the bottom to take the leachate off, which is concentrated plant food itself. And then at the end of the process, finally, you'd get a, a strong. Uh, worm compost, which would be stronger than normal garden compost. So you'd want to dilute that in water if you're going to liquid feed it, or not put too much into a potting mixture, or just top up your plants with the final product, worm cast. And that's because, again, in terms of scale, all of us can work on that small scale and do a little worm bin and have some worms, like I say, as pets on the go, producing fertility. Uh, not everyone can go up to the next scale and have uh, huge heaps of stuff. But yeah, worm composting, and again, there's a leaflet in there about it. Does so this, work, yeah. sorry, does that work all year round? Uh, and yeah, in the winter. Let's just go. The worms, if you put them in the sun in the winter, yeah. and in the shade in the summer, they'd be at the right temperature. And like bees, in the middle of the worm box, they'll actually maintain their own heat. So even when it's really frosty, it won't get into the middle of them. They'd stay alive. Uh, if they don't like it in your worm bin, they'll emigrate <laughs> and they'll just s s slide up, sl slime off the way. So this, this is the other type of worm, and this is Lumbricus terrestris. So this is the proper soil worm. This is its head, and that is its reproductive organ organs. And going back to that first picture, that was two worms mating. They put their heads under a little loop and they're both, uh, both sexes, so they're having a really good time. <laughs> uh, but yeah, here's the tail, and it's slightly flattened, and you can see a bit of excretia coming out of there. They need grit in the soil, so that in their gut, the grit is rubbed against the food to help break it down. So if you, if you just fed these on uh, vegetable waste, that's not enough of them. They need the soil combined with uh, forms of organic matter. And these ones, they'll go to the surface, and gather organic matter and take it down and digest it later. And often in uh, autumn you see like bits of leaves sticking out the ground, and that's what's going on. They're dragging them down into the holes. And their holes will uh, make not just vertical structure in the soil, but they'll go horizontally as well, and that's helping with drainage, so that water can run through and away. And yeah, when we had that really... Oh, what's up, Jess? When we, when we had the heavy rain two, two weeks ago, there was so much water in the soil that the worms actually came to the surface because they were getting drowned in, their, in the soil. Yeah. Give her a pat. So, Lumbricus terrestris, here's something related, and this relates back to what I was saying about the two ways the plants feed, one by osmosis, which is just sucking up nutrients out of the soil, and the more organic form, which is mycorrhizal association. And back to Dick's point about nitrogen, this is nitrogen fixation by peas, each of these nodules is about as big as a pea. They're pink in the middle, and that's where the plant, pea family, has got this ability to I ingest nitrogen through its leaves and deposit it at its root. So that's not nitrogen come from the soil, that's nitrogen come from the air, and that's this organic technique. So if we grow a legume crop, uh, or a pea crop, or a clover crop, and then plough that back into the soil, all these little nodules of nitrogen will be there gradually breaking down and available to the next crop. So that's one way to get just a little bit of nitrogen. But yeah, when we add bulky organic matter to the soil, uh, that will enhance uh, how much nitrogen forming can happen. Uh, if in some soils, if they've never grown a crop of peas before, they haven't got the microbes to start with, and you can buy an inoculant, about 20 quid a time, and it's basically ground up these. 
and that then means that there's microbes in the soil that, that when you do grow a pea crop, they'll fix more nitrogen. So that, that's one way of increasing nutrients in the soil. Here's some lovely amethyst mushrooms, and they grew in just a manure heap. So that's another byproduct, but again, illustrating uh, fungi and these microbes being a byproduct of lots of organic matter in the soil. So that's a dying back squash plant and mushrooms forming in the autumn. And then what we've got here is, this is one of my sites up on Hag Lane, and I've got a tonne of leaf mould. It's a midwinter, so it's been collected and stacked up. And then about a tonne or so of manure. And then this heap on the right, that's actually where I've mixed some of the manure with crop waste from this site, combined with vegetable waste, probably from beanies. And so I've actually diluted and extended and used the manure. I've doubled the amount, the amount of kind of product that I'm going to get by recycling my weeds and dead crops and also vegetable waste from the shop. And that will break down, heat up. And each time, in each case, that's at least a cubic metre, so there's a chance of things heating up. Uh, if you've got less material than that, all the heat escapes. It, it can't be recycled within the heap. So that's a point about the critical mass. When you get above a cubic metre, then it insulates the stuff inside, and the microbes can breed away, and then you get heat in compost and manures especially, but also leaf mould. I'll show you that in a minute. Yeah. After how many weeks after depositing it? Um, do you it's, just turn it's in the leaflet. Do you? Sorry. Uh, <coughs> but yeah, uh, you want a probably about a month, and then a couple of months after that, and then maybe a third turn. Uh, turn three months later. Just okay that outside bits in. And again, it's in it's in the leaflet, so it'll be answered in, in time. <laughs> but yeah, here's the picture to get used to scale. I got two loads of manure yesterday, and managed to sort them out by myself. But after that, I was knackered and I had to have a bath. But yeah, here's the trailer, and that will be, I'd say, about five ton load. Might be a bit more, depending on whether it's wet or dry. Uh, but that's the load that farmers are used to dealing with, and that would be. 30, 40, maybe 50 quid's worth, depending on its quality. But on allotments, it's great because we can get that much in. We use some of it this year, and then, like I showed you last week, we'll grow squash on the manure, mix some of it up with other wastes to make compost, and we'll end up with, uh, yeah, uh, getting several uses out of it before it finally goes into the soil and gets broken down. But that thing about scale, uh, if you're doing this from a standing start and you've never done it before, that would almost kill you, shifting that much stuff. So this is the point where if you've got mates, or if you can get a team together, or alternatively, do it over a course of about a week. But it's a major impact on your body. And personally, it took me five years to train up to get fit enough to do these kind of things, uh, to actually take on the tough physical work. But like I say, getting mates around and helping out other reciprocation is a great answer. Uh, here's a nice stable setup. And this is partly illustrating They've got a bit of fencing over this side, but they know how to stack a heap. And to stack a heap, you don't stand and put all the material forked into one place, because then it would create a dome, and it'd be constantly slipping out at the sides. So when you're building up a heap, each layer, you flatten each layer, bring it right out to the edges and consolidate the edges, and then you can stack vertically all these materials, manure, compost, leaf mould, and you don't actually need a composting box or a New Zealand box. One side is enough to just make sure it stays in place. So that's a, a good illustration. Each day they're clearing out stables and of course they're still using straw whereas a lot of stables have crossed over to that horrible wood chip yeah, or even rubber mats and they have a wet system where they flush all the manure and all the pee down the bloody drain. Seriously. Uh, <coughs> And they think, yeah, they think they're keeping their place clean by flushing all their waste mm -hmm. down somebody else. So yeah, that's a good illustration. Flat top, and then another layer, and flatten that out. And in that way, you could build a heap up to about 10 foot without it falling apart, without any supports. So that's a heap. And next we're on to my favourite topic, which is the collecting the leaves in the autumn. It's nature's kind of extra uh, bonus harvest for us. This is out on the lawn at the front of uh, Unston, and we're collecting turkey oak. It's a rather nice big oak tree. And that's then, yeah, this is another <laughs> illustration. Collecting it off the, off the streets, around the west side of Sheffield, there is no real contamination problem. There might be a tiny bit of dog mess, 
but all this material is going to get heated up and that will pasteurise a bit of dog mess. Uh, I've never found any sharps or needles in leaves, but I did find 10 quid last year. <laughs> <laughs> so that's bundled up into these builder's bags. It's, I collect when they're dry, which makes it a hell of a lot easier. So although that's a huge bag, I can fit three of them, that was my old car, I can get five into my new Land Rover, uh, and that gets taken off to different sites. That's a, by contrast the way the council do it. <laughs> that was a couple of months later in December, when all the leaves are horrible and wet and they've been trodden on. He's trying to get them up with a blower, but actually they're not moving, you know. They're no good for this kind of job. And yeah, I, I can work with a hay rake about ten times faster or do the job of ten men from the, the council. But they, again, I do it in October when the leaves are lovely and fresh and dry. That's when the manager's noticing that the leaves are on the uh, street and ordering the guys to go out a couple of months later. So they go, to go out in December, January, February, and they get the horrible job of collecting broken down leaves virtually. This is back when we had access to a van, and we could even do even more. One van load, that's about four cubic metres or more, and again, that will heat up. Uh, that's Daryl who does work in the hall when he used to enjoy himself instead of just earning a living, <laughs> jumping in the loop, <laughs> proving they're not dangerous. And then a couple of weeks later, uh, they're open structure, they can still draw, mo draw moisture and air in, and that's when the microbes digest all the material that's on the outside of the leaves. So this is not the finished leaf mould after heat, but that's uh, what's called thermophilic bacteria, bacteria which give out heat, and a big enough heat to insulate them, to keep them going, and they're just multiplying on the outside of the leaves and eating all the detritus that's accumulated on the outside of the leaves. They're not the ones that are doing the actual breakdown of the leaves. That is done by what's called a slime mould, which after this is pasteurised by heating, and therefore there aren't any competitor microbes in, in, in the heap, this slime mould creates a root system first, like a mycelium, like a, a, a fungus, and then later on, the next summer maybe, it will fruit and release more spores. But all these things are proliferant in the environment. So the worms, if you just dump a load of veg waste down and then come back a couple of weeks later, worms will find it. The compost worms will find it. They'll smell it and go towards it. And in this case, uh, there's enough bacteria on the leaves to do that heating up. And there will be the slime moulds, spores, floating around in the atmosphere. And some of them will land on the heap. So it's kind of without doing anything extra or adding anything extra, it'll all work. The one thing I do do is I add a little bit of the calcified seaweed, which has magnesium in it, and that stimulates and feeds bacteria. So not too much, not so much that, that, that it would turn the leaf mould alkali, but just enough to stimulate the bacteria and get them going. Uh, and then, yeah, that's another suggestion for stacking leaves. But again, that doesn't give you the option for turning them. And with all these heaping processes, compost leaf mould manure, you want to turn them two or three times. Uh, so that's great for getting them out of the way, but it's no good if you want to stack them. You have to take this apart, turn, it, turn the whole heap over, and re-contain them. So again, too much containment is actually stopping you from doing the turning that you need. So it's, it's, it swings and roundabouts. This is somebody's back garden, and they've got a big lawn, uh, and they've got big trees classic West of Sheffield story. So to combine the two, you've got the green nitrogenous material, the lawn mowings, and you've got the more carbon-based material, the, the uh, leaf mould, but they will react together and heat up together, uh, but it's the leaves that will be mostly left at the end of the process with a bit of extra nitrogen in. I like to make my leaf mould low fertility on purpose because I'm going to use it for sowing seeds and making cuttings both of which you want a low fertility medium for. You don't want lots of nutrients for a tiny little seedling. And after we've made decent leaf mould, then we can mix it together with other materials, and this is the process of making up potting compost. The white stuff is perlite, again there's a sample there, and that's being added to leaf mould, which maybe has had soil or topsoil added to it, maybe some fertilisers, depending on what we're potting on. I'll show you this later at session seven. <coughs> But yeah, we'd make different mixtures depending on whether we're potting on seeds, seedlings, or uh, a plant that's going to grow to maturity where we want to add more nutrients. Uh, the tomatoes in buckets, that's had a leaf mould soil, but lots of nutrients added, so it's still got nutrients in the bucket. 
And then we're on to the compost. <coughs> and this is the end of the process where we've stacked up compost. It's got lots of comfrey on top. And again, because we've stacked it in layers, I can stand on the top of that and it doesn't fall, fall, fall apart. Uh, and my compost bays tend to be two marine ply boards at right angles. And that's all. So that allows me to turn materials into the corner and around on a, a kind of cyclical basis, different materials. Here's, you know, it's not a terribly good picture. That's mixed crop waste, veg waste, uh, and there's manure in there as well. But yeah, if you can get a couple of punks to do it for you. <laughs> so this is when we were doing beanies veg waste up to about seven years ago. And we collect it just in regular domestic uh, bins, light enough to carry. And we dump that out. And beanies used to produce about 500 kilos of waste a week. It might be more than that now, because they've got even more turnover. But as we know from seeing the freegans going around the supermarket mm -hmm. bins, there's a lot of food thrown away. Mm -hmm. uh, but going to beanies, yeah, again, back to your point, Robbie, about purity. Mm -hmm. Some of this is actually organic. They've thrown away organic uh, material. Mm -hmm. And some of my mates still go and rob it out of the bins before it ends up in this situation. But mm -hmm. a lot of that is just standard uh, chemical produce food yeah. and it'll have residues on it and it'll have waxes on it and contaminants mm -hmm. but if it's been really well processed mixed with manures and heated up then none of those very little of that is going to survive and be a contaminant in the end process end product so then that is chopped up with sharp spades and depending on which particular vegetable it's chopped more like beetroots and onions chop them up a bit more so they don't regrow and then, uh, so there's another one, that's layered, layers of straw, manure, crop waste, cardboard, more manure, crop waste, veg waste. So it's layering, going up the heap, uh, adding in a little bit of lime, which you're not supposed to, but you can, and again, it's to feed the microorganisms. And we could also put, especially things like rock dust in there, which will then get bonded in when the, when the heap heats up. Uh, so breaking up card there, adding layers of card, and <coughs> again you can stand on it, nearly finished, and after we've heaped it up, then the liquid waste goes on, the 10% nitrogen liquid waste, oh it's piss, but it says it on the can, and those cans are actually great for collecting the you know, liquid waste into, you can get a couple of weeks within there, and that again will stimulate microbes, uh, maybe I'm doing this a, a week or two later, once the heap has started to heat up and there are microbes actively uh, feeding in there, then when I pour the liquid 10% nitrogen on, they'll just use that up, eat that up, and digest it, and it'll get consolidated into the heap. And then the covering, a layer of plastic, that's really to keep the moisture in the heap. So as heat rises and condenses, uh, the water goes back into the heap rather than uh, steam going away. And the final layer, that's the one that heats it, uh, that keeps it warm, insulates. So a layer of plastic to keep the moisture in, and then a layer of carpet. And in the winter, that's to keep the heat warm. In the summer, it might be to actually cool it down and stop it getting too hot. It's like the worms, uh, not too hot in the, on the summer. A couple more, this is up at Findhorn again, and they've got a lovely windrow system. So they've got so much material that rather than having just a square heap, they've got long rows and they are in the right proportion. No more than six foot wide and tall. These are about four or five foot wide and tall. Just so that air can still get in from the sides right into the middle of the heap. If you had a bigger size than that, you can't get air in and probably can't get moisture in if it's too tall. So that's the next stage up from just a square compost heap going for windrows. And this is a site, another biodynamic site down in Sussex where they've got a long heap. And Maybe they haven't kind of turned it enough. But that allows you to uh, yeah, compost a larger volume of material in one go. And then once that's made up, that's compost ready-made, growing a load of squash in it. Like I mentioned last week, uh, squash love bulky organic matter. And while manure or compost are sat through the summer breaking down and maturing, uh, you may as well grow a crop of, crop of squash in them. And you've still got most of your manure and compost left afterwards you've also got a food crop. I'll add one or two instances of people uh, saying that there are rats in their compost. Oh, they help a lot, rats. Yeah. They help to stir up your material. 
Yeah. I know they've, they've come along and said, you know, they've, they've broken the compost heap. Yeah. Rats are... Yeah, it's always going to be a question with food waste. Yeah. But, you, you know, we all know that within five metres of us, there's loads of rats down in the sewers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just in a, fu a fundamental point, uh, yeah, I've got rats and I've got squirrels on me a lot of them. And they're both doing exactly the same thing. Am I supposed to love the squirrels and hate the rats? No. So the only, the only problem with rats is if you've got standing water, there's a danger of Viles disease. In canals or standing water, you will get Viles disease, which you don't want to consume. But again, don't be prejudiced against rats because dogs carry Viles disease as well. So dog piss could be as dangerous as rats. So it's very much a kind of cultural thing. But yeah, uh, if you keep your he heaps on, a tur on the turn and don't leave them for too long, then your rats don't nest in the heap and you're not producing another generation of rats. So that, that would be my cut-off point. I'm not objecting to them being around. I can't get rid of all the rats in the world. But uh, I'll turn the heaps before they be become a, a greater problem the next generation. No. Okay, uh, so that's growing squash. And there's a lovely mixture of squash. And this is the nicest squash I've found so far. It's Marina di Chioggia. And I brought you one to try this evening, so we'll chop that up in a bit. Yeah, you can chop that up, Paul. And we'll try a bit of that. That tastes of chestnut. It's really lovely. So any of you who are taking squash and trying... So, not tried that. Nice. But yeah, winter squash again. Um, crack on through these. So what we're doing here, this is at the Community Compost Network annual general meeting, which we hosted at Anston for about the best part of 10 years. Uh, and this is judging the compost competition. <laughs> and that's Daryl. He, he became the judge for a while. Uh, we won it between us three years running, so we had to stop entry. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, we could make judgments about what was good compost. Of course, the best judgment is growing stuff in the compost and seeing how it grows. Mm -hmm. And seeing if it's gradual, gentle growth, or if it goes off and then stops. Uh, because, yeah, thinking about... We do know what good compost is. And then there are lots of products which aren't. Like this is some of the wood chip, which we get a lot of in the last 10 years because everyone's got a shredder, chipper. And that shouldn't be dug in the ground because it's too much carbon. It would rob nitrogen from the soil. But you can put it around perennials. You can put it around fruit uh, and nuts and things. And i put that picture in there because here's Sheffield's Dispersed Compost Network. And I take the, the credit for it being a dispersed network. They were just going to put, set up one site. And I went along and said, well, if you've got one on the east side, one on the west side, one on the north, one on the south, surely that's less transport. And then the guy who actually ran it had to drive his tractor from one site to the other. Yeah. So I don't know whether it saved much <laughs> petrol. Uh, and let's look. Yeah, so there's Mark. He was OK. But um, it's all machine-based, you see. So we've had several hundred thousand pounds spent on this now. And they're collecting all the material from the west side of Sheffield, where everyone's got huge gardens and could be doing compost anyway. And instead of doing compost in their own garden, it's carted over to the east side of Sheffield, the poor side of Sheffield, onto the manor, and this site uh, in the Don Valley. And the sides of these heaps are about 20 foot high and 20 foot wide, and no moisture gets, it, get, gets in at the top, and he's got no extra water to water it. And no air can get in from the sides, because it can't go in 20 foot wide. And that is not, not a functional system. And it's been replicated now. Another site they're doing is this. This is the Manor Oaks, up at the Manor, where Queen Mary stayed one night in 1500s or something. <laughs> and now they've dumped all their compost on their field. There's another mountain of it there, because they can't get rid of it and they can't sell it, because it's not compost. So they've got the green waste. If they added manure to it and activated it and add these inoculants, and brought in other material, or even just put soil in with it, that would help, because it would bring in microbes, and then the green waste would break down better. So what they've got there is just woody waste, some of which has been composted, and there is some humus in it, but when I've tried it and used it, you get a month or two of mm, lots, lots of growth, too much growth, and then nothing, and it actually goes into reverse, because it's just carbon, just uh, wood after that, and it actually plants then almost die in it, so it's no good. You can well, they might still sell it, or they might have had so many complaints that they don't bother to sell it anymore. But they've got rather a lot of it, 
that you'd need to get it riddled to take out as much of the wood chip as you can if you're going to take it off them. Mm-hmm. And the, yeah, they put so much on this field, it's actually going to, like I said, uh, spoil the field. I don't know what crops they'll be able to grow in it next year. Mm-hmm. But then they didn't grow anything this year, so let's see. But that's your, What's the name that's, of the project? That's your multi million pound project. Mm-hmm. It's Manor Oaks, Manor Farm, Manor right. Oaks Farm. Right. Mm-hmm. And that is part of just the tip of an iceberg because, yeah, there's a whole industrial scale composting thing going on. They've been trying to get farmers to do it, so they've been buying farmers, you know, big kit, 30,000 pounds worth of machine. Oh, here's another one. This is down in Brighton. This is a guy who just does it from landscapers. But again, loads of machinery, but he's only producing wood chip again. He's not adding value to it or adding material. This is something from about 10 years before, and he'd left it for five years. Again, he couldn't find a buyer for it because it's not good enough for customers to actually use it. So all these, each one of those pictures was another £100,000 of your money, or European money really, that's gone in, and funded these setups where they've been pretending to do compost, but none of it was really compost, or it's not really much good for it as an end product. Uh, smaller scale, again, this is repeating this point. This is a good way to use pallets, but to get that material from there and turn it into this bay, oh, well, you've actually got twice as much work, because you've got to turn it out first and then back in. So that's why I've ended up just mm-hmm. having a right angle and doing proper stacking. Uh, if you could remove this middle, then you could shift that material onto the left and put the middle back in on the other side of it. Uh, that's a simple point, but when you set up a composting area, and it's got permanent set dividers, you just think, over the years, you're going to double the amount of work you need to do. But then it does make you turn the heap. And I've said turning heaps is a good thing, so it's not all bad. But, uh, that's in relation to compost. And then here's one about, this is actually collecting up uh, weeds and dead crop. And rather than getting rid of them immediately, I've left them in the path. And I know that any soil, any slugs that are in this uh, tunnel will go for this dying material, they prefer rotting material, and then a couple of weeks later when I clear that away, and put that on the compost, uh, that will actually clear away slugs from that, from that site. And here's another one, again it's about re- reorientating our expectations. Matt's actually quite keen to scrape the paths, and that's because that material is going to go back onto compost, or onto a loam stack, and we're going to recycle the nutrients and get a second use out of it. So it's being motivated to do what is a, a, not a high status job, it's a crap job, but to clear the path, not just to make it clear, but to get more mm. fertility and to recycle the slug, that. The slugs go on the material fossil. Well, that's, that was the previous picture, but yeah. Okay. And here's another option. Again, this is one of Daryl Marion's sites. He took on a pretty ropey allotment. It had massively overgrown hedges, about 20 foot high. So he cut all the hedge down and stacked all the hedge material up. And then he'd scraped off all the soil and he got all the weeds and he put that on top of the hedge. And then he put some manure and compost on top of that stuff and he grew squash in it for one year. And after one year, it had broken down to about half the height and it's starting to turn into soil and the woodiness is breaking down. A year or two later, that had completely broken down and become a lovely bed of soil. And this is called German Mound Garden. Uh, basically stacking up materials that aren't really compost yet, but are, uh, it's, it's a way of sorting out a site like this uh, over the course of two or three years, a slow, gradual process. But rather than burn all the wood, which would lose all the nutrients up into the air, uh, that's a way of retaining all the nutrients on the site, basically a big loam stack, incorporating all the material. And then an old picture of beanies, and this is a couple of weeks' worth of the card that they produced. And we export that to various sites, and that's a dead easy job. We take that around and mulch orchards and fruit trees with card, two or three uh, layers thick, and that suppresses weeds, the the worms eventually come up and drag the cellulose from the card down into the soil and use that up so it gets used. But all card now is uh, pretty much organic because the inks are carbon based and they've taken out the cellophane and the sellotape and the staples that they used to use in packaging. So that's actually a good material to use but only on the surface again. And then just a little bit on the concentrate, on the bulky organic matter going in the soil, that's the leaf mould going in. Spreading the seaweed, adding into uh, potato beds here, and then adding lime and uh, blood fish and bone or chicken pellets there. And then the last bit, which for this, so we're nearly ready for tea. Have we got the, fill them up. Tea's coming. 
And this is the sewage system. And the way I like to introduce that is you might pay £50 for the, the first picture of the big trailer of manure, yeah? And then you might spend 50 quid, well, on one meal. Or let's say 50 quid on a week's food. You, you're eating quite well. But that's the value of what's coming out the other end of you. And rather than flush it down the loo and send it off to the North Sea uh, and through the sewage works, uh, you've got this option of deciding to go independent and retain your own nutrients within your own cycle. And so that's what I've been doing, shitting on bits of newspaper, which is the best thing to do with newspapers, I think. A <laughs> couple of sheets of newspaper. Also, yeah, rather than using Thomas Crapper's invention, the porcelain plinth loo, uh, and that isn't actually a healthy position to do your business in, for one thing. So squatting down, uh, depositing on a bit of newspaper, wrapping that up, and you get two weeks material, solid waste, into each of these boxes. And again, the crucial bit is to learn to operate, uh, to, to, to be able to produce s liquids separate from solids, which we, we all can do. Some of us have forgotten it. But yeah, <laughs> uh, that's wrapped up in newspaper, put in a box. After a couple of weeks, I've got enough to dig a deep hole. And that will be deep enough so that there'll be six inches of soil on top of the material so the rats don't find it and go down for it. And then, yeah, that's the material going in. And then I'll plant a comfrey plant into each position for every couple of weeks with. And that will grow up. That's just within a couple of weeks it will start to get growing. Comfrey, that's the full, full growth of it in flower. And it can do that five or six times during the summer. So <coughs> that's the amount of bulk of material you can get out of uh, just one deposit. And I've got an area about 20 square foot, 20 foot by 20 foot. And that takes my year's product and sorts out my solid waste. So my liquid waste goes onto the manure heaps and the compost heaps and the, even the leaf mould. And then solid waste gets buried into the compost. First, it's digested by the microbes in the soil and the worms. And then it feeds the comfrey plant. So it's already been through one cycle. And then before it gets back into the eating system, it's composted, mulched, or I make a liquid feed out of it. And this liquid feed in a water butt you can actually see there's little maggots in here, they're called rat tail maggots, and they indicate when the comfrey is fully mature and ready to use on plants. And that's got a lot of potash in it again. Can I have the lights? Uh, so that's, yeah, lots of pictures about organic matter in various ways. I've overrun, sorry about that. And today we've got different types of tea again, and some salad with toasted oat cakes. Paul's going to chop up, chop up the Marina de Chogia, so we'll have a look at that. Let's have a five minute break, so starting about 25 2, and I'll just go through the other uh, leaflets before I finish. Anybody got here late? I'm collecting fruit stock orders. There's lots of uh, potash in it, really, so yeah. It would be easier to get than leaves for me. If you collect it, any time before mid-August, end of August, when it's flowering and the spores are coming off it, it's carcinogenic. Mm. So again, at the right time, when it's young, yeah. But if you just say it to people, collect bracken, they might go out and get too many lungfuls of it and ruin the lungs. Right.